Welcome to Embedded FM, the show for people who love building gadgets. I'm Elisio White, here with Christopher White. Guess who's here this week? Ben Krasnow. Should we talk about electronics? USB processors? Fire? Electron microscopes? Wet chemistry? Hackaday judging? All of those things at once? Ah, oh, that actually reminds me, before we get started, Hackaday is having a weekend conference in San Francisco, November 14th and 15th. The conference will be quite inexpensive to attend, so it will fill up pretty quickly. Keep an eye out if you want to make it. Although if you really want to go, possibly even get some travel assistance, sign up to give a talk or workshop. I'll put the link for that in the show notes. There's no deadline. So once they get enough awesome talks, they're going to close the proposals. Not an opportunity to procrastinate. Hi, Ben. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a hardware engineer at Google Life Sciences and also run the Applied Science channel on YouTube. What's your background? Um, mostly electronics and mechanics. I guess I like the title hardware engineer a lot because it encompasses both you know, mechatronics, PCB layout, mechanical engineering, all that sort of stuff. So Google Life Sciences. Yeah, we're the first Alphabet company. It's all public now. I, I, I have no idea what, that, what Google would do with Life Sciences. They're rewriting our DNA, or at least making it searchable. Yeah, our mission is to transform healthcare from sort of a reactive kind of system now where you only go to the doctor if you're sick to something that's proactive. So, you know, advancing healthcare to be better detection. Okay, so probably leveraging the search and machine learning kinds of things that are already there to apply to health science. Yeah, it'd probably tie into it, yeah. Well, I want to ask about Google, but I also really want to talk about your YouTube channel. Sure. And that's Applied Science. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit, for people who don't know, what is it? Um, I liked, I, so it was originally called Ben Krasnow. That was the title until I changed it to Applied Science because I thought that was more descriptive. And even then people complained about the title change, but I'm, I'm glad I did it because uh, the channel is really about applying science. And so I like to take a topic and then show how you can actually do a sort of a real world demonstration of a scientific principle. And you do it from first principles yeah, more or less. It's like very physics-y. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely stay away from the math. You know, there's, it's pretty rare that I bring out like a hardcore math equation, but I, I do like to sort of bring things back to, you know, more or less first principles. I did a recent series on like the Faraday effect, showing how you can control light with magnets and electrics. It's pretty cool. And you had uh, uh, polariz polarization filters in order to get the light to go one way. And I didn't even know that was a thing. I, you know, I thought the effect was way too small to even visualize with sort of on camera without any sort of special equipment. And so I spent quite a while trying to track it down, but was happy to actually capture it and show it to people. I, I loved watching that video because I, a long time ago, I took a class in electro optics and it was all very theoretical. And, you know, there were some examples in PowerPoint presentations of this is, you know, the kind of thing you can do with electro optics. And they're all very expensive, of course, because exotic materials. That was the first time I'd seen a demonstration yeah, of, me of anything electro optical, uh, you know, with household materials, basically. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that is sort of the whole point of the channel is just to show people. And so if you search the internet for Faraday effect or, or magneto optical effects, you would only find equations and sort of the driest of explanations of what's going on. And so just having like a two or three or five minute video even, just showing it in action is a pretty big win. How long have you been doing it? Um, probably since 2011. So my breakthrough project was the, the home built scanning electron microscope. That was kind of the thing that just launched the whole channel off, you know? Oh, so that's, I thought that was new. Well, so that I have two now. So the first one I built myself in 2011 and that was like, you know, the key project. And then recently someone donated a commercially made SEM to me uh, about a year ago. Okay, so you are officially the first person I've ever met who has two scanning yeah. electron microscopes. And really hilariously, a day or two ago, someone offered me another one. And I said, you know, I think I've kind of it, hit the limit. Is this some sort of thing? Once you have one, people start giving them to you? <laughs> How many at at shirts do you have, Christopher? I don't think that rates. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to start getting comments at Chipotle. Yeah, no, it's true. And so, yeah, I mean, eventually people will kind of associate you with an object or, or many of them, and then they figure, well, you must really like them, I guess. I, exactly. You know, you're a collector now. <laughs> right, right. So you do it every week? Um, that was kind of the plan at one time. Um, 
funny enough, YouTube contacted me and said, hey, would you, you know, like some coaching? Like we're doing this kind of plan where we talk to YouTube creators and kind of help you out and you know, give you some tips, not knowing that I had recently started working at Google. And so I said, yeah, I'm actually right across the street from you. <laughs> you can just talk to me through Google's chat system or whatever. So anyway, so they gave me some helper tips. And at the time I was thinking maybe I would convert to a, a once a week format. And that just didn't last. I mean, I the time required with a full-time job was just no way. Yeah, video is a lot of work. Yeah, I and mean, just, just having the discipline of doing like kind of a new project every week or at least just having some kind of an update every week was uh, not going to happen. So how do you choose? It seems like, I mean, I was the example of the Faraday effect, did you come across that and say, well, okay, how could I show this? Or it seems like there's... You cover a lot of topics yeah. on the show, from optics to electronics to mechanicals. And is it just stuff that strikes your fancy or? Yeah, I guess I'm trying to remember how I exactly thought of the electro-optical stuff. A lot of times it'll be like a passing conversation that I had with someone where they're like, oh yeah, there's this cool effect, but I've never seen it. And then that's like, that's like my cue to basically start researching it right there. It's like, oh good, something that everyone knows about, but no one's ever actually seen it. So I, I like doing stuff like that. How long do the videos take to put together? Um, some can actually be fairly quick. I mean, if I already have the thing that I want to show built, um, that, that could be a one evening kind of thing, basically. But building the stuff and getting it to work. So I chased the, the electro-optical stuff for cumulative probably a day or two, like with magnets and vials of olive oil, basically looking for it over and over again and not seeing anything at first. And so do you do you script ahead of time or do you kind of wing it? It's mostly winged. Um, I'll kind of pace around in the garage and think about what I'm going to say. And of course, it's edited, so I'll say things a few different ways and then take the one I like the best. But I generally don't write anything down, so it's more or less off the top of my head. Well, sometimes you have the math areas written down. There was one about lenses and Fourier, and you already had all the Fourier ready to go. Right. So if I do a drawing, I'll make that for beforehand. Yeah, and that's definitely a huge time saver there, too. Like, I've been tempted to do computer-generated animations and sort of better graphics. Mm. And I just don't want to let the genie (laughs) out of the bottle. Because once you do that, that's like, that'll probably double or triple my time budget at least. And, you know, it's, I think that the hand-drawn sort of figures go along with sort of the the low mid-production value of the whole channel. And so it kind of fits. And I think people sort of like that. So, Do you ever think about trying to make it? Glossy, glossy. Yeah, I have thought of it um, for a while. I even considered doing it sort of full time. Um, it, yeah, you know, I still occasionally think of that a little bit. But um, I recently was sort of a contractor at Google. Actually, and went full time this week, and so that's Congrats. probably going to be even less of a thank you, <laughs> even less of a thing now. How does Google feel about it? I mean, they're kind of. I don't know. Anytime I, I interview somebody from Google, I, I try to make the point. Yeah, if you don't have a public life don't come on my podcast, they might fire you. Yeah, I mean, what's really, really funny is that's how they hired me was through the channel, actually. So someone (laughs) at Google saw it and was like, hey, let's, you know, bring this guy in. And at the time I was, you know, doing fine at Valve and everything was good. But it kind of planted the seed. And then later on, I realized that we had to start the conversation again. Okay, for those of you who just twigged on Valve and were like, oh, let's talk about that. We will get back to it. But I want to talk more about the videos first. Uh, why do you do it? Why, why do you do the videos? Um, I mean, as a hobby, okay, but this is years of, of... Yeah. it's There's a lot of cool... I mean, there's sort of a lot of um, equally important reasons for me to do it. Like, it's it's partially a good personal motivator. So, if I feel like, you know, people will send me messages like, hey, you haven't uploaded a video in a while. What's going on? So, it's like, okay. So, at least I can sort of force myself to stay focused on projects because I feel like someone is actually paying attention. That's a really good personal motivator, or I guess it's an external motivator at that point. Um, It's also a good like personal project journal for myself, just a way to look back and see all the stuff I've built. Uh, That's pretty neat. Um, I do it also because I I do in fact get paid. So the YouTube, you know, sends me ads revenue and I have the Patreon stuff going too. Yeah. How long have you had the Patreon stuff? Patreon. Oh, wait a minute. Christopher should explain Patreon because he explained it to me. I did? Initially, yeah. People give you money. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe you should explain it, Ben. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a service uh, where people can directly sponsor a YouTube creator or any artist or any any sort of a creator, and um, they can either pay per video or just give you a monthly sort of donation. And it's a it's really nice because it's direct from the consumer to the creator, and Patreon just takes a very small cut, so it has nothing to do with ads. It's just totally 
you know, one hand to another. Yeah, and like you said, it's a continuum between tip jar to special stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So people, it's kind of like, I mean, they have what sort of like Kickstarter style rewards where right. if someone uh, pays more, then they can get, you know, special access or privileges or special topics or that sort of thing. And so you, what, what, why was YouTube not enough? Why did you do the Patreon too? Um, I kind of like the model a little bit better. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being ad supported, but I mean, it's it's even nicer to have people just paying directly because they feel more connected to the content that's being created. If you pledge, you know, three dollars a video, you have a real stake in sort of enjoying that video because you're three dollars committed. Whereas if you're just ad supported, people just kind of drift in and out, and they aren't really as connected. And so I like my channel a lot because the viewers tend to be very interested in the topics that I'm talking about. So it just kind of fits better. Well, then you don't have that many ads. I mean, I only seem to see an ad once every four videos or something. Uh, That's something that YouTube controls. And so all I do is tell them that um, I'll allow ads on my videos and allow them to be skippable, basically. So I can force people to watch the full 30 second ad, but that's the only controls that I have. Otherwise, the number of ads and the type of ads are YouTube's thing. All right. So why videos? I mean, I, I, I prefer, you know, voice, uh, but also writing. And you have so many diagrams and schematics, they go by so fast sometimes. Yeah, uh, it's true. There's a little bit of room. I actually do have a blog too, but it's just a collection of videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kind of try it a little bit here and there. If I'm going to post code or other still images, they'll go to the blog, which is, again, not very often. Um Video is, I, I like consuming video the most myself. Like I think YouTube's kind of 10 minute chunk is almost like the perfect size for myself. So it's 10 minutes is enough to get a topic across, but not so long that people kind of tune out or kind of tune in and out as the video is going by. So I like YouTube's format quite a lot. And it's basically just wanted to create something that I like consuming myself. That makes sense. I, I tend not to be a video person. No. And so it's, it's a little harder for me to get into the video mode. Cool. Well, you know, what he's doing harkens back to like Mr. Wizard and, and Newton's Bill Apple and, and Bill Nye and those sorts of things, although with, you know, less. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. In fact, I I mean, Mr. Wizard, of course, a huge inspiration of mine since his show is, you know, sort of similar to mine and that he would have segments. And right. Each segment was about 10 minutes or less. Very, very easy to stay focused for the 10 minutes. Right. And they were always some demo of something and it was, this yeah. is how this works. And yeah. if you want to learn more, here's how to learn more. Yeah, I definitely liked Mr. Wizard. So did you always do projects like this before the videos and you just started videoing them? You had been doing this your whole life as just playing with stuff and pretty much my output definitely went up when I started doing the videos just because of like the the um you know the motivation factor there. But yeah, I've always done projects um not as ambitious and not as many and I and also I just haven't had as much time. So I graduated in 2005. And then prior to that, of course, school just owns you completely. Right. <laughs> so do you have favorite videos you've posted? Favorites? Um, yeah, yeah. Like uh, the um, the animation of the phonograph needle in the scanning electron microscope. That was a real popular video and, and also one of my favorites because I had never seen a scanning electron microscope animation before. So it's kind of funny. I mean, of all the SEMs in the world, as far as I know, no one's ever actually used them to do stop motion animation, which seems kind of like an obvious fit. And I've got a lot of other tricks I'm planning to do with mine too, in addition to more animations. You did a, a dust mite too on the skinny electron microscope? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, yeah, flea. Was it alive? Uh, no. So the, if you're going to do... Because um, that would be cool too. <laughs> well, so I'm trying. So <laughs> the, the problem is that everything you put in there has to be in high vacuum. Like really, oh, you that's know, a little hard on the critters. Yeah, so there's that, and then even worse than that, if it's not conductive, it has to be coated in metal. Right, you coated the uh, LP in some sort of silver thing. Oh well, what are those weird creatures that that they they can live in va- in space? They're little insects. They look like uh, it's a tardigrade. That yeah, that yeah yeah. I, so I have already. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried it yet, but they're going to be. Uh, they're coming up. Yeah. Wait a minute. What is it? I didn't. It's like a. A little water creature, kind of like a brine shrimp, basically. But they're they're very sea small. Monkey? Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. It's of that scale and everything. And they're supposedly like the hardiest animals ever in the world. They can survive in deep space for a few months or something like that. They can survive radiation that would kill. Yeah, they're everything. they're they're insane. Yeah. How do we know they survive in space? Is it because we, they we, come from space? I think we took them there. <laughs> sure, we took them there. <laughs> 
Uh, it's cool that it's a macroscopic. Like if you were talking about a, a, a bacteria, you'd be like, well, okay, it can survive in extreme conditions. But this is actually like a macroscopic little critter, which is pretty impressive that it can handle all this. It goes dormant too. So while it's frozen to death, it, it doesn't actually die. It just goes to sleep. And when it thaws out, it warms back up. How are you going to make it conductive? Yeah. So you have to coat them in a very, very thin layer of metal. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine with that, I'm sure. Well, if it, radiation doesn't kill it, maybe exactly. the metal won't either, you know. Also known as water bears or moss piglets. <laughs> I know what I want for my birthday. <laughs> yeah, I can give you a billion of them. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any videos that are less favorite but are super popular? The ones that kind of got out of control? Um I don't know if they got out of control, but some of them were definitely misinterpreted. And back when you have, you know, like five or 10,000 subscribers, it's not as big of a deal as when you have, you know, 100 or over 100, or even when you have 100 subscribers or something. And so I did a video where I put a, an LED inside a contact lens. <laughs> and so at the time, I was working on augmented reality at Valve. And um, there, there was this news cycle where uh, some researchers at University of Washington were uh, showing how they put an LED in a contact lens and then put it in a rabbit's eye. And uh, at the time, we were researching the topic quite heavily, and we kept trying to tell people, you know, putting the electronics in is not the hard part. I mean, it's really not the hard part. It's really the optics that are the challenging part with augmented reality. So I went home and took two of my contact lenses and sandwiched an LED in there, a surface mount 0402 LED. With a battery? No, with a coil. Oh, okay. And then I powered it inductively through a coil that I just held up to my, to my eye. And it flashes, no, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not transferring much power and it's only over an inch. This is your worst nightmare. I, yes, contacts Oh, oh you shouldn't alone. wear that, you shouldn't watch oh. that video then because it's, it shows my eye red and irritated as I'm like poking, you know, the contact lens in. And it's blinking. And it's blinking. <laughs> and, oh yeah, and it's blinking, right. You, and you can see the blinking, right? Well, so for the, for the uh, benefit of the viewers, I turned the LEDs so that it was facing outward instead of in, so as it would be for an augmented reality contact. And the point was supposed to be a joke. I mean, I was basically showing people like, well, clearly, you know, I mean, not to poke the researchers too much, but the LED itself is not the hard part. It's really the optics. And a lot of people completely misinterpreted what the video was was kind of about there. And it got a lot of views. <laughs> Did you ever wear it anywhere without no. telling people? Because you could build the inductor as sunglasses and you hmm. could be a Borg. It would be awesome. It was. It would need a little refinement. If, if you do end up watching the video, you'll see why I couldn't do that. Just because it was horribly painful. Like I could only. <laughs> My eyes are watering. I know. Just thinking I, know. About I'll, it. I'll, I, won't, I won't describe it too, in too much more detail. But yeah, it was. People. The comments were a little bit out of control in terms of how they thought I was experiencing the pain of this contact being in my eye. <laughs> or did they think you were in more pain or not uh, nearly enough? <laughs> probably about the right amount, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what other favorites do you have? Um, let's see. I, so the SEM stuff has been good. Uh, I guess the super critical CO2 stuff has been like a perennial favorite. Um, I, I was inspired by a video made by Brady Heron, who does all the uh, periodic videos and 60 symbols and all kinds of other uh, videos. And he interviewed someone at University of Nottingham who had a, a chamber with CO2 in it. And if you heat it up, the CO2, which is in a liquid and gas phase, turns into a continuous supercritical phase. It's pretty weird. The division between liquid and gas just disappears. And then when you cool it down, it like becomes turbulent and you see the things separate back out into gas and liquid again. And so I thought that was pretty neat. Unfortunately, his chamber was built with sapphire windows to contain this high pressure environment because it's a couple thousand PSI in there. So I did some engineering and built mine out of acrylic and it worked. And so I made a video about that. That seems scary. Yeah, hey, I engineered it, you know, formulas. I even okay. posted into the blog, you know. <laughs> well, that was one of the things I noticed with your uh, your channel was that it was sort of bodging it together, building yeah. it oh, yeah. out of scraps, maybe not buying that thing that you should have bought, instead just trying to figure out if you can make it. Yes, definitely. I like that aspect. And that's that's even kind of what I do in my day job. Like we're a sort of a rapid prototyping group. And so going fast and basically just making the core idea testable very, very quickly is is my day job. That is the most fun part of engineering. And I'm so super jealous. That, that I can't there believe are people. you got that as your day I, I know. Job. <laughs> so, so, so that is why I decided to go full time. Everything's working great. And so, yeah, it's a it's perfect fit for my, my approach there. So moving on to Valve and maybe getting back to electron microscopes. 
Uh, you were there to do part of the VR headset that they're coming out with this year. The Vive? Yeah, so the work I did uh, did lead into that, yes. Uh, what should I ask you about it? I mean, Valve is known for being awesome games. and. Well, I have a question. All right. Custom. Half-Life 3. That's yeah, yeah. Coming in. No, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, you know, the hardware team probably knew as much about that as any as anyone on the outside. Even <laughs> uh, do you? What do you? What can you tell us about their VR system or what you worked on there? Yeah, so uh, the the deal with HTC uh, hadn't happened. Uh, be- you know, I left before that whole thing got off the ground, so I don't know the details about the Vive. So that's the new one. Yeah, so the Vive is is the thing that um, HTC was building in conjunction with Valve, and so but before I left, we we didn't know anything about the, the HTC stuff. And so, did you work with uh, Jerry Ellsworth on the cast? Well, not Cast AR uh, on the whatever it was Valve. What became Cast AR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Jerry was uh, their first hardware engineer hire, and I was their second in in 2011. And Jerry and I uh, worked pretty closely and basically built their hardware lab. Uh, so they had a, a table and two soldering irons when we started. Oh, my God. And they said, we want to build a hardware lab. You're like, we're going to need a microscope. Uh, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> you're already there. Yeah. So it was quite a journey. Yeah, we uh, we set up their machine shop uh, and, and built basically all of their infrastructure up up until, uh, you know, until later. Yeah. Do you have opinions on different approaches for VR versus augmented reality? Yeah, VR is kind of a subset of AR. And so if you have like a working pair of AR glasses or headset you could just put dark stuff in front of it and it would be a VR headset, basically. So it, it, VR actually makes it a lot easier to accomplish all the, you know, solve some of these technical problems. You know, the electronics don't have to be see-through. Uh, so VR is, in my opinion, sort of a stepping stone on the way to full AR. And augmented reality is when you can see through the electronics and it pops up, like I can walk through a room and here's a troll all right, that's sort of cool. But VR, if I walked through the room, I wouldn't be able to see my furniture. Yeah, exactly. And so, right, right. And then there's, to make it even more confusing, there's annotated reality, which is like having email notifications that don't interact with the environment very much. That's like Google Glass. Yeah, exactly. I I, you, I shouldn't ask about Google because you either can or can't say. <laughs> I'll just say I don't know. It's okay. <laughs> you can, uh... um, why is what what happened to Google Glass and why are we? You're in the wet cat. Ah, I don't blah, know. Blah, blah. I don't know. <laughs> okay, how about why are there so many VR and AR um, systems coming out in the next six months? What happened? Did somebody figure two something years out? ago that made it so that everything became possible? Yeah, I think there's two big things, and so one is high resolution uh, OLED displays, and so Samsung basically controls the flow of high resolution OLED cell phone sized panels to the entire world. And the resolution eventually got high enough where if you put one of those in front of your face with the lenses, it started to look pretty good. So prior to phones being, you know, in the neighborhood of 720p, it wasn't at all pretty. But now with high resolution cell phones, it's pretty good. So that was the major tech change that made VR kind of a thing. And then also Facebook decided to invest $2 billion. And so that basically changed the entire business landscape. And uh, Well, Valve and Cast AR and even Microsoft were getting started before the big Facebook deal. I know, but no one was writing articles about it. And none of the articles had the words $2 billion in it. <laughs> well, that does help. Yes. Oh, it helps a lot. And so, I mean, if, I mean, it's the way the tech sector works, it's very much sort of, you know, watching what other people are doing. And so if Facebook feels that it's worth $2 billion, that has a pretty big effect on the entire market. Was there any advance in optics at all, or is it just pretty standard stuff that they just happened to figure they could de-warp with GPUs? And- yeah, so that actually, that, that is the, the one innovation that helped, and that wasn't even specific to optics per se. In fact, right. it, it was almost a, the enabler that allowed crappier optics to still look better than, than they should, basically. Right. Yeah. So I would say in terms of tech you know, innovation, it was mostly the panels and that's like OLED, you know, deposition technology and Samsung basically just being masters at display. And what about head tracking? Did inertial sensors help with that or did it all go camera based or why is there less hurling than there used to be? Yeah. So, so this is actually where um, Valve's major contribution was or is, or, or at least was when I was there. Uh, head tracking is another pretty, pretty big ingredient in virtual reality. And so, um, a few people at Valve, including myself, developed this lighthouse tracking system, which is very precise, six-stuff, fixed one-to-one to the world tracking. 
And I, I brought a little prototype here, which doesn't work as much on a talk style show, but uh, it is pretty cool. Let me assure you. <laughs> Looks a bit like a flux capacitor. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it really does look like something that you put on your desk and everybody says, what is that? And you say a time machine. Yeah. So I designed and built that. So it has some influence in that. <laughs> so describe it. It's, um, this is the lighthouse tracking system that, that is public. Um, so we talked about it at Maker, or I should say we, Valve talked about it at Maker Fair this year and uh, all the technical details are out. Uh, it's basically a, um, an angle to time converter and it measures the angle from this box that sits on your desk to your headset. And then based on that, it can figure out where your headset is in space. And all that six off tracking information makes the VR experience a whole lot better. And so it can not, uh, six off is six degrees of freedom. Right. So it's looking, at, when I say six off, it's usually accelerometers and gyros. Oh, right, right. Sorry. So yes, uh, in this case, six off would be six rotational axes and six translation, or sorry, three translational and three rotational. So when you're in the headset and you turn your head from left to right, it can track that as well as movements left and right. Cool. And uh, the resolution is very good. Um, in addition to the Samsung panels being pretty important to VR, also having this really high resolution tracking was also a key thing. Yes, because that's really, I mean, the tracking... Uh, the video and the head being off sync was what made people sick. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned not hurling anymore. A lot of the work that was done at Valve was to combat simulator sickness. And so making sure that people are in a one-to-one -one environment. So when you're in virtual reality and you turn your head, the world must move the way that your brain is expecting it to, or otherwise there's this discongruity and you, you feel sick. It's really bad. It is really bad. And some people can't even take it for like five minutes. So I heard at Valve that when you had headsets on that were in VR mode, so they were dark, people would come up and startle you. Were you part of that? Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we did some interesting experiments with forward-looking cameras, and we found out that doing like picture-in-picture -picture is actually very effective. It, it first seems like it wouldn't work. So the idea is that in VR, most of your field of view is taken up by the game, but you might have a little tiny window in the corner, which is actually reality. <laughs> and it's very mind-bending because you start to feel like, you know, usually you're sort of aware of the real world and then having a small screen in your field of view that's a screen, like an LCD monitor or whatever, but now you're in a virtual world and the screen is actually the real world. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking, I, I've seen some other examples where people put cameras on the outside of an Oculus, so you're wearing the thing and then the camera sees what you would normally see and then they pipe it back, which seems like a lot of work for, you know, just take them off. But it seems like you could do not augmented reality, but altered reality yes. things and you know, warp things. Oh, and, yeah, and yeah. It seems like a hallucination simulator yes. is really easy now. <laughs> no, no, so that, no, definitely. And so, yeah, people have come up with other phrases to, to um, it's like mediated reality or basically just like other R's basically of kinds of reality. But yeah, the biggest problem is latency. And so getting the frame from the camera yeah. processed into your thing through the game engine back out, I mean, it's, it's a lot of, lot of work. So you're telling me I can't live in a cartoon yet? But um, soon. I'm pretty close. I don't know where the cutting edge, I, you know, I don't work on it anymore, so I'm not sure where the bleeding edge is, but definitely moving all that data is is challenging for any computer system. I uh, have a friend who went to Valve who arrived shortly, actually, after you left, um, electrical engineer Phil King. He was a past guest, too. Uh, he mentioned that there are various stories of your mad scientist uh, antics at Valve and then he sent out an email there uh, asking what I should ask you, but I didn't warn you about this ahead of time. <laughs> so feel free to pass on any of these. But one of the things the Valve folks suggested I ask you about, tongue butt troller? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> is, is that, that one word? That is all one word. I think it was, well, they were separate products, but then they, then they were put to merged. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I... Um, I, uh, I, so at separate times, totally unrelated, did videos using um, a tongue and, and your rear end as game controllers. And it's made, natural. And yeah, and made videos of this. So the reason is that um, when we're thinking of the AR stuff, you know, your hands are busy with the real world. You're opening doors, you're driving your car, you're doing stuff. So you need a way of controlling a UI without using Wait, your Wait, you're hands. driving your car? Oh, for AR. This was before VR. Oh, sorry. I was thinking of playing a game while driving my car. Oh, that? That's probably not the application you were thinking. Directions. Definitely maps okay. and directions. Yeah. 
Um, or, you know, you're just walking down the street or sitting on your couch or whatever. But um, yeah, so, it, you know, what else can you have, right? So for VR and for gaming type things, basically just rocking in your chair side to side or fore and aft is actually pretty natural. And I, I liked that. So I, I took a like a $20 Target scale, bathroom scale, and just wired the sensors up to basically the buttons on a game controller. So when you Because those usually have four Yeah, exactly. Things. Yeah, and they, they gang them together in the original application, but I split them up and just yeah. took the signals out. And then if you leaned in your chair, you could control the, you know, the game controller, basically like a, the D-pad. It was, you know, it's okay. It's pretty good for motorcycle games. I'd say yeah, it's I pretty could good. See motorcycle games, yeah, especially, exactly. that'd be fun. So, I, you know, I was, so that was the first project that I gave to my intern there. I was like, all right, you're going to do the butt troller, as we called it. And uh, they all thought it was pretty dumb. And, you know, it is kind of a dumb idea, but I mean, you know. I don't know. It's the whole, how did you hurt yourself? I fell off a, bar, a bar stool slash motorcycle yeah yeah <laughs> for, for active games you know it's very like it's not anyway but then the tongue controller was was also thinking about uh, sort of interacting with a ui on the go so if your hands are full and you're walking or you're sitting somewhere or something um you, you have a lot of muscles in your tongue you can actually do very accurate movements but you can touch every tooth in your mouth individually with your tongue Right. And so are you going to put like a retainer sort of thing with electronics in there? That's exactly what it was. It was a retainer with like an optical mouse camera. I'm having a flashback to <laughs> Buckaroo Bonsai right now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I had both wired and wireless versions. So we, oh, we're laughing about this. Good. <laughs> we're, we're laughing about this, but for, for disabled people, that could be a huge... It, you know, having an accurate... It uh, is. And, and so they already exist, uh, unfortunately. So I, I, even, I looked into it and the, the state of the art for disabled folks is they actually a pierced magnet in the tongue. Oh, really? And then they put Hall effect sensors like outside the mouth and it, it you know, it, oh. I didn't try one, but it doesn't Probably look not something you're going to sell to gamers. No, it's a little too invasive. And so I wanted to have one that you could just put in and out like a retainer very quickly and, and have tongue control that way. And again, it worked. It was okay. You know, probably not going to take the market by storm, but you know, it was there. Well, then with the <laughs> tongue controller too, now with less piercing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, so then they put it, you know, so Valve, I don't think was too crazy about me doing videos, you know, about, about tongue butt controllers. I, I learned right away that the media is not going to be very friendly to you. And so if they are going to get clicks out of running a story, they're going to run it in a way that gets them the most clicks, regardless of how you come out. Valve engineer makes... Ridiculous. That's <laughs> yeah. precisely the headlines they went with. It's like, hey, thanks, guys. And they picked like the most ugly still frame out of me showing this tongue controller. It's like, all right, all right. I'm cutting you guys off. <laughs> well, the butt controller is essentially the Wii Fit board. Mm -hmm. The standing board. The yep. standing yeah, board. With two, that has two load cells. So It only has two load cells? No, because you can do front and back. Oh, it's got to have four. All right. Yeah, well, I had, I had rotation too because you could spin around in your bar stool at the same time tipping. But, you know. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing to ask you about, Turkey slash Furby x-ray machine. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did x-ray a Furby. Well, who hasn't, really? Yeah. <laughs> As someone who took BB-8 apart. Wait, I why do you have say, an x-ray machine? Actually, that was donated by Sophie Kravitz, actually. And so I... I I think I came down here and packaged it up and FedExed this uh, dental x-ray machine back up to Valve there. Why did Sophie have an x-ray machine? Uh, <laughs> it's it's x-ray machines all the way down. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, you know, a family member or friend of hers had it or something. You know how these things get passed around. I guess the question is, why don't I have an x-ray yeah, machine? Well, yeah, Because you're about to move it and making you throw everything away. Oh, my God. That's terrible. <laughs> Do you want anything? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, x-rays are great, you know. I mean, it's, Yeah. What did you find out uh, with the Furby? Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, actually. It's a pretty, you know, heavily produced object. I mean, there's actually more stuff going on than you might think. If you have your own fluorescent screen, you can actually do your own live motion x-rays, which is pretty cool. So we had the Furby dancing around while we were shooting it with x-rays and looking at its, you know, guts moving on the screen. <laughs> you do have a video of that, don't you? Uh, I'm afraid not. It's too uh -huh. dim for video, but... Um, yeah, it, it is very dim to show up on video, but I think we should probably try something like that again. I've got another x-ray set up at my place. Of, of course. course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> As one does. It, it, is your place where you take the videos, is that part of your home garage or do you have a separate site? Yeah, it is. It is my uh, detached garage in Redwood City here. And so I spent about a year and a half looking for a place in the Bay Area based solely on how big its garage was and finally found this place. Do your neighbors have any idea? No. 
<laughs> no, in fact, I, I, I at some point, not one of my neighbors turned me in uh, to the state radiological health board because of one of my x-ray videos, actually. And um, this guy kept leaving his business card in my door, like, call me, call me. And I was, you know, kind of working in Seattle at the time, so I had an excuse. I wasn't home at, at all. And uh, eventually, I caught up with him, and he was like, well, you know, it looks like you were shooting x-rays off without any kind of an enclosure there. So, you know... <laughs> And he offered, if I built an enclosure for it and added a key switch, he actually offered to come by and certify my custom-built x-ray machine, and then I would have had a legal custom-built x-ray machine. Would have had. Well, I told him I, you know, threw it all out, you know. If I ever if I ever got another one, I would, you know. <laughs> I feel like we should roll back in the show just a few minutes, but okay, we're not going to. Sorry. But, you know, if anybody has some lead that they need to give Ben, I'm sure he needs right. it. <laughs> We're going to be x-ray safe in the future, let's just say. At least lead line the whole garage. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Start with that. Nothing go wrong with that plan. Yeah. And so you must have x-rayed a turkey as well. Yeah, I got a, I got a, I built an x-ray backscatter detector. So at the time when I was commuting from here to Seattle all the time, I would go through these backscatter detectors every week. Mm-hmm. And so I was very familiar. At the, air, at the airport. Yeah, 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 at San Jose. Funny enough, they don't have them anymore because... They're stupid. Turns out they don't work. Yeah, and and or they couldn't prove that the x-ray dose wasn't oh, yeah. significant. It was very unclear how that whole thing happened, but they're gone now. But at the time, I was kind of interested in how they work. So I built my own backscatter detector and x-rayed it or backscatter detected a turkey hiding an Allen key in a sweatshirt that I put on the turkey. <laughs> as one does with one's turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> that video actually didn't get as many views as I thought. I thought that was good, especially because it was like at the peak of the TSA and like people You may were, need you know, to I'm repost that to, for yeah. Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm looking that one up yeah, as yeah. we finish. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the turkey slash Furby really were two separate incidents. I'm sad. I thought that maybe there was the Furby inside the turkey, like a tur- <laughs> tur- fur- 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 oh, Be very careful that. with that. <laughs> It's not going to go anywhere you want. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, it was definitely a separate. I don't recall ever doing a turkey and a Furby in the same video. Okay, so. Senator, I have no recollection of that Furby. (laughs) (laughs) Caffeine of extraction. Oh, yeah. So that actually is related to the supercritical stuff. So one of the ways that they decaffeinate coffee now is to force supercritical CO2 through it. And all the caffeine dissolves away in the supercritical CO2. And then when you, you know, suck all the or excess CO2 out, you have decaffeinated coffee. I thought they just ran water over it and I was essentially getting second brewed. Yeah. Mm. So that's called like the Swiss method or something yeah. like that. And so people were concerned that there's too much industrial processing. So one way is to run water over it. Then you extract the caffeine from the water, probably with supercritical CO2. <laughs> then you run the water back into the coffee to put all the flavor components back in that you took out the first time. <laughs> wow. But this is why decaf costs more, and I know that, yeah. and I'm okay with it. But so the but thing now it, I'm less excited about. I, it. I know, and so it's worse is that up until recently, the solvent that they used instead of supercritical CO2 was methylene chloride paint stripper, and so that was actually the decaffeinating solvent that they used up That's until. Good for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, in theory, there's none left. So. <laughs> so at the end of this process, you presumably end up with a whole bunch of pure caffeine. I had a little powder pile mm-hmm. of caffeine. <laughs> what did? I still got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I just was <laughs> going to compare caffeine to other drugs. It looked pretty, so, you know, thumbnails are it's a way It's not to something it. you'd want to ingest. Yeah. No. Oh, no, no. Well, yeah, it was probably a lot of cups of coffee. So, you know, it wouldn't kill you probably, but it wouldn't be great either, let's just say. I remember in school, we used to have 101 nights at one of the dorms that I didn't live in, so I didn't really participate. The North? No. Um. And they would lay out a 10 by 10 and put shot glasses on each one. And there was 101 tequila night, which, of course, a lot of people got really sick on. And you tried to get drink as many in the 100 as you could. Oh, this. But um, people actually got sicker with 101 Dr. Pepper night. Ooh. Because there was so much caffeine and they were pounding them. Yeah, yeah. And so it it went really badly. Mm. I, I There was a lot more... Uh, Hospital runs that night. Wow. Dr. Just, Pepper. Yeah. I think there might be other reasons beyond the caffeine. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that it was only Dr. Pepper sometimes. Okay. You did have, you know, people with access to a modern chemistry lab. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes. And more time than sense sometimes. Although, of course, we love you, Mud. Uh, and Westmore. 
So cookie perfection, actually, I already knew about. That uh-huh. one I didn't need a hint from the Valve folks because one time I tweeted snarkily on Twitter about being an on-demand cookie source for someone, <laughs> Christopher, and uh, <laughs> and somebody pointed me straight to an actual on-demand cookie source. Yeah. <laughs> Do you keep your, your cookie-making robot on standby with butter and sugar ready to go? No, sadly, I mean, it is, uh, people like the idea so much, but of course you can imagine keeping like the butter and the eggs refrigerated kind of in the robot at the same time it's ready to go all the time is actually pretty challenging. In fact, more challenging than building the thing. That seems like it's within your skill set. I think you should. Well, you know, again, there's always these ideas, these side projects start taking off and people are like, oh, you've got to, you've got to commercialize that thing. It's a cookie vending machine. Yeah, People exactly. just push the button and it bakes you cookies. I know. So we've, but I have talked about it semi-seriously with people and, you know, it's one of those ideas that kicks around and never really got quite enough traction to get off the ground, but it's, you know, it's there. The future where Mrs. Field is a robot. Actually, I think I saw that in Futurama. Yeah. So yeah, the customization angle is one where it's like you, you can tell it exactly what you want, like, you know, chocolate plus chocolate chips plus peanut butter, whatever is your combination. And the fact that it's freshly baked. Dr. Pepper, pure caffeine. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that was one of the things that when I bake cookies, I, I start with the ratio method where cookies are one part butter, two parts sugar, three parts flour, or two parts butter, three parts sugar, four parts flour. And then, you know, just go from there. Right. And so people come over and they get cookies and they want the recipe. And I'm like, I don't I know. I can't remember. I, I know you just saw me make them. I It was either one, two, three or two, three, four. And now we're done. And I don't know. There was some amount of vanilla. I don't know. Do you do that generalization of recipe or do you have one that works really well in your machine? Hmm. Uh, my starting point was the recipe on the back of the Toll House morsels. Yeah, morsels. a good starting point. I know. And then, you know, not surprisingly, they've honed this in over, you know, 100 years or whatever. So it's pretty good. <laughs> the whole idea with the customization angle is that some people might want to tweak it a little bit. Like, no, I like more chocolate chips or no, I want a softer cookie or a crispier cookie or that sort of thing. And then you could have you wouldn't have to bake a whole batch of like one person's desired thing. You could split the batch and do like, you know, oh, yeah. half and half or even just one of each, you know, one of each style or something like that. And I think the the really interesting idea is to, if you scaled it up to like production thing, what you do is put like a QR code. This actually be a real use for a QR code, probably the first ever. And people could vote, <laughs> first, you know. The <laughs> is this a QR code in frosting or something? No, no. So here's what you do. So you bake different cookies And then when the consumer buys it, they can scan the QR code and say, I rate that cookie a 7.8 or whatever. And then in aggregate, you can track which cookie recipe is getting rated higher and have like a real-time evolving recipe. You can even scale it towards certain demographics or certain geographical areas or something like that. I thought that was actually pretty cool. That is an inappropriate use of data science. (laughs) Genetic cookie recipe. Yeah, constantly evolving, yeah. Although I think I saw on Sirius Eats where he essentially did that. Really? Where he... Like incremented the amount of baking soda versus baking powder and uh, warm butter versus cold butter because that's a different mix method. Hmm. It was in cake flour versus regular flour. I'll I'll send you the infographic on that. It was very amusing to see all of the different paths. Um, But yeah. So how long does it take for for your robot to bake cookies? Um, I never built the mixer. And so what it does is it dispenses all the ingredients into a plastic cup and then you you have to mix them together and so right away people fault to me like oh, the, the butter mixing i mean come on you know, it's, i thought it automatically baked them no i'm afraid not it's just an ingredient dispenser oh i thought it you, you need to add it to one of those industrial toaster machines exactly. that it rolls yep. around yep. that was talked about quite a bit when we were thinking about commercializing the thing for real but that's actually not nearly as bad as the mixer like the mixer is by far the worst most difficult mechanical part of the entire thing Would you like to see my KitchenAid? Well, so the problem is mixing one cookie's worth of dough. It's like ridiculous. (laughs) Like more sticks to the spoon than is in the cup, right? Oh, no. Well, because sometimes they make small amounts of cookies because I don't (laughs) like to have a lot. No, there's, you can get one of the little uh, small mixer ones that you use for soup. Oh. Uh, It's, do you remember what you call it? What that was called? It's a hand blender. The hand blender, but there's not, there's the one with the two Mm -hmm. uh, things that go around. It comes one with one thing that goes around, and that works pretty well. Huh, okay. And there are ways to get the dough off automatically. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so we're going to have to cut this part of the show because we might need to patent all of it? (laughs) Not so much. Let's see, I was kidding about fire uh, in the intro, but you do actually have a liquid nitrogen generator video? Yeah. What does that have to do with fire? I just, it was the opposite of fire. Yeah. (laughs) So, and you, you, you... Built a way to generate. Can you go tell us yeah. how you do that? Yeah, that that was another one of my early Maker Fair projects that, that got a fair bit of attention. And um, I don't even know how I found the original. Uh, there's there's this cryo cooler. The heart of the liquid nitrogen generator is this device that gets very cold all by itself. It's self contained. And um, I don't know how I knew that one of these devices existed in an industrial piece of equipment for cell phone stations, but it does. And so in a lot of cell phone towers, they need a really, really tight notch filter to filter out the frequencies coming in from the antennas. And so there's this super conducting notch filter, and it actually cools its electronics down. Really? To, yeah. So it's a soft filter that's super conducting. And so they need to have a little cryo cooler in there that gets the whole thing down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. <laughs> but the funny thing is no one actually knew what was in the box. And so on eBay, they were going for like 200 bucks is like, you know, junk surplus. And I bought one and pulled the cryo cooler out and had this thing that if you pulled it out, it would actually, air would condense and drip off the, the cold part of this thing. <laughs> so I ended up shifting the whole market after I discussed, after I, you know, told people that's what's in the box, the price, you know, doubled uh, or tripled on eBay and it's, it remains that way till today. <laughs> Man, you shot yourself in the foot with that one. <laughs> but how do you extract nitrogen specifically? Yeah, there is an, a membrane that's selective, and so you, you can actually get okay. nitrogen-enriched uh, air out of it. But even if you don't... It's the, still cold. It's still very cold. And then if you... I mean, the oxygen's even more fun to play right. with, right? So yeah, it's not a bad thing <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> I did the classic dump liquid no- uh, oxygen onto your barbecue, and that's that's always a lot of fun. There's, 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 so there was a guy that like, you know, pioneered this technique on, on the internet before, long before YouTube. And uh, he's got like a two gallon bucket of liquid oxygen and goes up to this smoldering barbecue and just dumps it in one go. You know, there's somebody we we have to introduce him to. (laughs) Yes. Yes, there is. There's nothing left of the barbecue. Like it's just the metal is melted. Uh, Like it's completely gone. (laughs) That's that's, yes. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Now I have all these. (laughs) This raises so many questions. So many questions. Uh, have you done any, uh, videos about fire? Um, yeah, I had a recent one where I had some flash paper, like magician's flash paper, which is nitrocellulose. And I wanted to build it. Which is also what ping pong balls are made out of. Yes. So quit using ping pong balls to make your LEDs less annoying. Oh, has that anyone ever caught one on fire? They won't burn super fast. They but- burn very fast and oh. it's really fun. <laughs> Yes. Someone with an LED actually had enough power to, to light one up? Oh, it has happened, mostly because there's a short elsewhere in the circuit. Oh. Um, huh. But yes, if you go buy a six-pack of ping pong balls, take them outside and light them on fire, it's really cool. Exactly. And yeah. there's some videos of people putting hundreds of ping pong balls. We didn't suggest any of this. Hmm. I said go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there a disclaimer that's like, well, if you blow yourself up, you know, it's too bad, basically. You know? What Ben just said. Yeah. <laughs> Don't try any of this at home. <laughs> or Yeah, yeah, basically. We but, do try it at home, but with the fire extinguisher and only right. one ping pong ball at a time. Yeah, yeah, that's reasonable. <laughs> On a skewer. Christopher didn't really appreciate the skewer, but I think that was because I got, had a beer first. I'm sorry, I'm on the phone with the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. I mean, burning stuff is fun. And so it, flash paper is basically just a very thin pin, ping pong ball. And so it's, it's, it has a high enough surface area where it burns, you know, really rapidly. And I wanted to um, see if I could do computation with the fire. So if you cut the, uh, the strip into a, you know, a specially made pattern and then light it, potentially you could have it burn in such a way that it does computation. So this sounds kind of silly, but let's say you you had like an encoding no, system. No, this that is entropy winning. Fire is entropy winning. It can't... Okay, well, so the, ener- yeah, the energy is, is in there and then you're using it. So it seems like the energy is flowing downhill. So as it's on its way down, you could use it to do work, you know, computation maybe. And the nearest thing that I got to is one of these domino computers where you set up dominoes. And someone did do this on YouTube. It was another Brady Harn video actually. And... By tipping the dominoes over, you can have it 
knock like a gate over. And then when the, the chain of dominoes gets around to that gate again, it's open and it, the, the, the signal doesn't go through. So you actually can build logic gates with dominoes. And you could do the same thing with fire. Basically, it, it burns the fuse out and then it can't go through there again. So you could do that. But I wanted to have something more like superposition where you put like a strip of, of paper on top of another one. And then the combination of the two burning would give you some kind of an additive effect. I'm not actually a data scientist, so it just sounded like a good idea. And was it? I didn't get it to work. But <laughs> Sounds like building Minecraft computers in the real yeah, world. Exactly. It's like, there's got to be something there. And yeah, it's the energy source. And Go back in time and suggest it to Babbage. Yeah. Yeah, gears, I don't know, man, but fire. Fire, That's where it's at. It makes for better video content. <laughs> There was a group that actually had cool readout. And so what they did is they put metal ion salts on their strip of flash paper. And then as it burns linearly, it changes color because it's going through all the metal ion salts, you know, like purple for potassium right. and that sort of thing. Hey, and you know, coconut water has a lot of magnesium. Really? So you just wait for that to evaporate and it'll all be so much more fun. Really? I don't think it has enough magnesium. I don't magnesium. think it has that much magnesium. <laughs> I'd rather light my vitamins on fire. Huh. Well, actually, so the nitrate, if you, if when you do burn a ping pong ball, you notice that it has a yellow flame. Yes. That's mostly from sodium impurities left over from when they washed the nitrocellulose with sodium bicarb. They neutralized the acid from the creation process. And so I think the actually true nitrocellulose burns almost colorless. That's mostly the sodium ion that you're seeing in those things. Kind of disappointing. Yeah. I hate things that burn colorless. Not only are they dangerous, yeah. they're just not that much fun. Hydrogen fires. Methanol fires. Yeah. Going back in time, as somebody just mentioned, um, how did you get the second scope? If you built the first electron microscope, how did you acquire the second? Yeah, a very uh, generous viewer um, said, well, you know, it looks like, you know, you could use one of these. (laughs) And uh, he had been storing it in his apartment in Sweden since his university wanted to throw it out. So it's actually surprising how often a university or even an industrial research group wants to throw away, you know, a once million dollar piece of equipment. It happens actually fairly regularly. And so he rescued it from the trash in Sweden and kept it in his apartment, but he was moving and had to get rid of it. So he said, do you want it? If you pay for shipping from Sweden, it's all yours. So how much would that sort of microscope cost now? Um. It's a good question. The market is kind of weird for, you know, old, old, like out of date scanning electron microscopes since no university would want it. Um, But hobbyists would. So it's kind of a, but they're hard to move around. So they aren't easily sold. Uh, You might figure a few thousand dollars on eBay or Craigslist, something in that range. How big is it? Um, About the size of this desk that we're at, just about. So three by six, three by nine. Big. Yeah, big enough. And it weighs four or 500 pounds. It's on casters and yeah. Requires cooling water. <laughs> what makes, I mean, scanning electron microscopes, I thought, you know, that was kind of, there There are some newer technologies that can look at more atomic things. Right. But, I mean, once you get to scanning electron microscope, there's this wall there. How do they get better? Why is yours old instead of... Yeah, it's it's a good question. Um a lot of it comes down to the source of the electrons. So the earliest source is just a hot tungsten wire. It's the same thing that vacuum tubes use in lots and CRTs. Um, and the, the tungsten wire gets hot and it boils off electrons and you focus them down to a point. But the problem is you can't make the tungsten infinitely sharp. Like it still has size to it. So later on, they came up with better and better methods that have like sharper and sharper points to launch the electrons off. So the next revolution was lanthanum hexaboride cathodes, which is this beautiful purple crystal that has, you know, like a two micron point on it. And that shoots the electrons off the tip of that. And then even that wasn't good enough. And so now the modern tech is field emission, which has like a essentially a one atom thick tip that it launches electrons out of. Could you replace your tip? Um, Maybe. I, it would require probably redesigning some of the other parts in the column, but yeah, potentially. I even have some lanthanum hexaboride that I was thinking of throwing in there, but the uh, vacuum requirements are higher too. So you need an even bigger vacuum pump, you know. That's probably what most of the equipment size comes from. Is, it, it's true, is yeah. Vacuum. It, it's just generating the environment is the worst thing basically for a SEM. And you've looked at LP records. Yes. And little tiny, tiny fleas. Yes. What else have you looked at? What is the most surprising thing? Yeah, the most surprising thing. Um, 
probably DLP mirrors are pretty cool. So a DLP chip has these tiny little 10 micron mirrors on it. Um, and each one has a hinge. <laughs> so you can look at that under the SEM. That's pretty cool to see like an entire array of these 10 micron mirrors all hinging. Um, what I really wanted this, of course, was animated to see the thing yeah. flipping. Well, unfortunately, you know, at that scale, the flip takes about a microsecond or 10 microseconds or something on that range. So you can't possibly view it in real time. You'd have to do it in stop motion. And then freezing the mirror, like making the mirror go to a partial position is not easy either. Is there anything you've done? I haven't looked at the microscope stuff, but I'm assuming you've married this to modern digital capture stuff. So it's yeah. not... The, the, yeah, so the scope I have is like early 1980s vintage or even designed in the late 70s. And so their entire board is replaced by just code on a microcontroller. Right. It's actually shocking how much stuff is in there. I mean, it's all discrete logic. So that the the scope as in its original form has no firmware whatsoever. It's entirely solid. And um, you can replace hundreds of chips, of course, with one library that takes, you know, a couple lines in a microcontroller. <laughs> when you used a Teensy. Yeah, I did. I used the Teensy LC. And, and so that's what's doing your capture. Yeah. So I, right now the scope is still taking care of its own scan generation and the Teensy is just picking off the data stream. But eventually I want to do full scope control with a microcontroller. Will that let you go faster? Yeah. Then you could arbitrarily pick different scan rates. You could even have different scan patterns. There's no reason to raster it left to right. You could do spiral raster scans and all kinds of cool stuff. Why would you care? Um, it's... It's sort of a trick that MRI machines use. You can uh, spiral scan, and then you get more image data from the center of your image quicker. Oh, all right. Which is kind of neat. Yeah. And then you you pump that out to a USB controller. Yeah. So I use the Teensy's own uh, USB interface to do basically a, a serial port link back up to the computer. How is that working for you? Pretty good. So the theoretical limit for USB uh, full speed is like a megabyte per second. It's like 10 megabit or something, 12 megabit. And um, as it is, I'm not even close to that. So as fast as the ADC can sample the stream, it's it's not uh, filling up the USB pipe. Would a more precise ADC give you better data? Or where is your yeah. bottleneck what's your, here? What's your... Noise limit, I guess. It's well, some, so the the SEM itself is actually limited in how um, good of an image you can get out of it in a given amount of time. Right. So if you scan faster, you get less signal, and it's an interesting trade off between how good you want your image to look and how fast you want to go. And the trade off is actually much harder to deal with than people might think. Like you actually don't get very much signal out. So to get one really sharp frame is about ten seconds of scanning. So the you know the the bandwidth is of course no problem with that scan rate. And so that isn't an ADC problem. That's just a how fast you can shoot off. It is. In fact, yeah, it's a physics problem. So if you just bombard the sample with more and more electrons, you eventually destroy your sample. So you can't actually extract more signal out of it without, you know, literally destroying it. (laughs) Yeah, because at that that size, the electrons are little tiny cannonballs. Yes. Yeah. Little tiny cannonballs. The ultimate, the ultimate limit of quantum mechanics. Yeah, it's you've really, observed your target way too hard. Yeah, and you're counting basically every photon that or every electron that converts to a photon out of that thing. It's that's weird. I mean, when I think about electronics, I don't really think about electrons. Yeah, shot noise is a big problem. So when you're scanning fast, you're, you're getting down to the, the absolute bottom limit. Well, I think we should. Uh, I, I I want to keep you here pretty much all afternoon. But uh, in case you don't have the time, we should talk about Hackaday. Sure. Welcome to the Judges Corner. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, have you peaked? Are you looking at the things ahead of time? Or are you waiting until we get our, our notice? No, I'm waiting until we get our notice so I can see them all at once. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, of course. No, it's, it's going to be great. And have you looked at the uh, judging criteria? Mm-hmm, I have. That's good, because I hadn't before. I well, it just started. recently came out, right? Actually, it was part of the rules. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, of course. I knew that. We should, we should read the rules yeah. just to find right, out. Right, right, right. <laughs> so is the non-judge, is it different from last year? Uh, yeah, there are some differences. Um, primarily, they wanted to focus on saving the world this year. And uh, so they have some new judging criteria on that. And fewer or, or no judging criteria on how connected it is, which was a little tough to decide last year because, I mean, it connects to USB, that's connected, right? Or it connects to satellites, that's connected, right? And so it was a little hard to say right on that one. But it's still 
uh, open and wow factor are the same. Um, this year, it's is the project reproducible and could be extended for other uses? And does it address a wide ranging problem? Mm -hmm. So, how long do you think each entry is going to take you? I, you know, I'll, I'm the sort of person who would probably spend a long time on it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to shortchange anyone, give everyone equal attention and everything. So, yeah, I'll probably look pretty pretty carefully at them. Yeah, I think we have 50 entries to look through each. It's 100 entries are in the judging pool, and each judge will get assigned 33. Okay. So on that order, yeah, 33. So, you know, I don't know how many minutes each, but I think it's suspected to take a day or two to kind of work through them. Yeah. Yeah. I think 50 last year, it took me two, two and a half days. This year, they want us to give feedback, mm -hmm. constructive criticism. Oh, that's a new thing. That is a new thing. Cool. Yes. And I think it will be hard because you're going through all these things and it's hard not to say, but you weren't like the last person I looked at or that sort of thing. And flipping through them so fast, it's hard to give really good detailed criticism without coming off like a jerk. Yeah, that's the uh, age old question of like interviews. Do you actually tell a candidate why they weren't hired? <laughs> Most companies have decided not to, of course, but uh, <laughs> some do. But it is, I mean, I think that as judges, we really have to remember they are learning something that is mm -hmm. always part of Hackaday. Right. And they're doing this in public, which is terrifying. So we have to at least applaud their courage, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. even if they're making something that we don't deem yeah. socially good or, or technically good or even... Uh, you know, it's Some other stuff. criteria, yeah. I mean, that's... I think it's going to be fine. I think most people you know, don't take it too seriously. And so it's it's not going to be a, a disaster if their project doesn't make it. But even getting to the finals is a pretty big honor. Oh, it is. And oh, yeah. financially too. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they have some nice prizes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we should talk about judging after we do the judging. Okay. Hey, we could give them some feedback, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think people want feedback from here. I think they'd rather get their feedback in private. Oh, it's private feedback. Oh, that changes everything. <laughs> well, I think Hackaday gets to see it. I see. Um, I, I, and I think there was some mentioned that in the previous round, not, not all of the feedback was nice. And so they didn't give it all back. So oh, we have, wow. We have to be nice. Wow. We may get censored. Christopher has taught me the ham sandwich method of constructive criticism. I'm pretty sure it's a turkey sandwich. All right. Um, where you have a compliment and then the criticism and then a compliment right so you just have to make a sandwich i like bread though so i mean you know what's wrong with you know it's, it's <laughs> oh and last year there were some that i don't think i could have said anything negative about it was just like this is amazing hmm. good job your hair looks nice today you're fired <laughs> <laughs> and there's, you forgot the other piece of bread this is oh. this open face <laughs> <laughs> don't let the door hit you on the way out <laughs> So Andre uh, from the Great White North asks, what tools should everybody have? Screwdrivers, hammers, pliers, scanning electron microscopes. What else do you recommend? Wow. Well, for uh, uh, for what kind of work? I mean, basically any old hacking, any old building? Yeah. For I, for uh, electronics, firmware. Okay. Electronics, the hacking you do. Yeah. So I'm definitely more comfortable with hardware. So anything I can do to make my software life easier, I immediately latch on to. So, of course, the Teensy, Paul Stoffergen's awesome libraries that save, you know, hours upon days of time, I absolutely love. Um, the, the the USB stuff that he's done makes it so easy to send fast stuff. And, the, you know, the ADC libraries and everything else is super helpful. So I would say if you're a hardware person, find a really, really easy to develop with stack. And so for my computer side of that sanding electron microscope project, I used processing.org, which some people laugh at, but man, for prototyping graphics, I mean, it's like 10 lines of code and you've got a graphics window up. And so if you do this through Visual Studio, you'll have, I don't know, probably a, 50 few, hundred, files. 50, a few hundred lines of code to get a graphics window up. Yeah. And so it's, it, by the time I downloaded Visual Studio, I already had a working prototype in processing.org. So I was like, yeah, I think I'll probably just uh, take the easy way. So as far as tools goes, I would say get yourself a Teensy. It's always a good, super rapid prototyping base. Cool. 
but that's it. Uh, <laughs> no, I have a long list of tools. I mean, uh, soldering iron, microscope. Yeah, I like Hakko soldering irons. That's kind of been my standby for a while. Um, American Amscope from Amazon. They've, yeah, yeah, they're they're really cheap, but they're really good too. I mean, the quality is just surprisingly high on those. For the longest time, when you went to the Amscope um, site on Amazon, it said it was a two pack. A two pack. It had a little two pack oh, symbol, really? and we finally got one. And I kept hoping there would be two in the pack, and there was. There was probably two eyepieces. That was that's a binocular oh. scope. You think that no, might no, no. I don't think no. so. But I've I've ordered many of them, and so I bought them, you know, for my home shop, for my lab at work, for you know, lab at Valve, and everything else. But yeah, they're they're really great and pretty reliable. Uh, get yourself one of those, and also the hot air rework stations. This is another funny thing where it's like the cheap ones are actually pretty good, and the expensive ones are only marginally better. So you can get a, like a hot air station for like fifty bucks on Amazon, and then the next one up is like a Hakko for like eight hundred or something. It's like no, it just blows hot air. It's, Really, I, that is not one we have, and it is something that I wanted recently. Hmm. Very handy. I was even doing BGA and LGA rework at work, and you don't need an expensive, you know, <laughs> you can do it with a $50 hot air gun. It's a conspiracy of big solder. I know. <laughs> what don't you have that you want? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so, you know, a water jet cutter is, is really <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, yeah. So, you know, don't shoot small when you're yeah, faced with the question of what do you want. <laughs> uh, I've, you know, seriously considered it. It's a little it. hard to build, too. Yeah, it is very hard to build, and I have looked quite a bit into <laughs> of that. Of course you have. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, there, there is a guy. So, if you search for DIY water jet, there is, of course, someone out there who did do it. It looks like a, like a senior project, or maybe like a thesis or something like that. And it works. He's even showing it cutting quarter-inch aluminum. So it's not a joke. Um, it's just, you know, combining it with the CNC's controls and even compensating for taper of cut and all that sort of stuff is what you're really paying for with the big machines. And they're very, very energy hungry. It's like a 30 horsepower motor that runs those things. I know. And most of the energy, of course, has just gone into heating the water. But you do need that much power to actually cut even weak materials. So... DIYing one would require starting with like a 30 horsepower induction motor and getting getting worse from there. <laughs> well, and his only cost $5,000. I know. It's an impressive build. No, I really liked it. <laughs> I think you're... <laughs> oh, we're, we're conflicting over the definition of only there. Well, yes. have you seen the price of actual commercial machines? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's six figures or above, right? Uh, well, I think some of them are a little less than six figures, but they're... It's bad. Yeah. It's, yeah. And they're very heavy, of course. And yeah, it's. I saw one run at the tech shop. It was well, it really, was really cool. The size it, of a small room, too. Oh, yeah. And the, it filled the whole room. It has a couple of super nice benefits. One, it doesn't heat up the cut zone. So you can cut any materials that would otherwise be affected by a laser cutter. It can cut any hardness, just about up to stone, even. We were cutting glass. There you go. Yeah. It can cut brittle materials like glass. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to clamp the work, so you can cut brittle materials that would other guys be destroyed by clamping. Um, it can cut almost five axes. It's like wherever you aim the jet, it will cut. So you can even do undercuts and things like that. And it's a pretty cool machine. Do you have a laser cutter? Uh, no, not at home. I'm tempted by those sometimes, but mostly because I would cut paper or foodstuffs. Yeah, it, it is tempting for that. I mean, in uh, acrylic too, if you do a lot of like... Yeah. Um, the you know, prototyping just, boxes. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. Flat construction is, is super yeah. good, yeah. Yeah, I do have a lot of my prototypes live in cardboard boxes. Or much tennis to my ball embarrassment. containers. Yeah, or tennis ball containers. <laughs> hey, it was sitting there. You talk a lot about science and electronics together. Mm -hmm. Why the combination? Why is that what applied science is about? Um, I guess... Mostly just personal interest. I mean, electronics are um, electronics are sort of a way that people make a living with engineering. That's much more common than sort of applying basic uh, science principles in demonstrations. And so it's kind of nice to have a like a really practical side of the channel, and also a little bit more of a kind of flash demonstration whiz bang kind of side of it. In fact, actually, that in my most recent video, I talked a lot about firmware and electronics, and some people. Some people like it and some people don't. I think the channel has uh, audiences that are both centered on much more of like electronics engineering and then also just sort of like a topical science channel. What did you say about firmware? Um, I went into the details of how the, the structure of the thing that I wrote for the Teensy works. And so it's not, 
you know, a great feat of firmware or whatever, but it is actually going fair, a fair bit beyond like the typical Arduino hobbyist crowd. Um, the timing with the interrupt, interrupt loops was pretty critical and also just ordering the, it uses the nested vector interrupt controller on the thing there. And it ordered which uh, priority was important and all that kind of stuff. Well, and if somebody's trying to reproduce what you've done, did that's certainly helpful to go into that oh, yeah. of detail. Yeah, exactly. And so I did post the code and everything, even as bad as it probably is and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> it was code. It's a skinny electron microscope. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, could you scan some cake? I've always wanted to see what cake looks like. Cake? Yeah. Yeah. You can scan cake. Got a metal coat it, but it'll, it'll work. Um, it'll be slightly dehydrated. But that might affect the structure a little bit, but it'll more or less be okay. There are some metallic coated cake sprinkles. That's right. Actually, those would probably work just fine as is. Do you get color out of your skinny electron microscope? No, nope. it's just surface texture, okay, which yeah. is, um, you know, the electrons don't know what the color of the thing that they're hitting, but they do know, you know, they are affected by surface topology. Um, and that's a benefit and a curse. Like, it's nice that you actually aren't distracted by surface, like coloration or absorptivity. But um, if you're interested in that, of course, you don't get it. So, yeah. What energy is the photons that are emitted? Are they invisible or? Uh, the electrons coming down the column, like the incoming. So w- once they hit, presumably yeah, yeah. it knocks off a photon and that's what you detect? It's actually more electrons. And so oh, it, makes, it makes like an electron cascade. Okay. And there's a couple, two distinct signals that you get. One is actually very um, slow moving electrons. So the ones coming in are maybe 10 kilovolts. And then they create this plume of like low energy, like two to 50 volt electrons. So they're basically, if the ones coming in are going three tenths the speed of light, right. the ones that come off are just swimming. I mean, just drifting around in comparison, even though they're still going thousands of miles an hour in comparison, they're just drifting. Right. And so then they're attracted over to the detector and, and you get the signal out that way. Okay. So you interrogate each, yeah. each spot. Okay, it sounds very similar to laser scanning. The, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. it's and so you build up the image pixel by pixel basically. It's a lot of fun. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you've been to our office. When can we come over to yours? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before you guys move out of town or even after if you want to come back for a visit or something. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. I really should put together more kind of shop open houses, but I I haven't yet to date. Ooh, party at Ben's house. Yeah. Applied Science Live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one. <laughs> So have you found that having the YouTube channel is an enabler for other things? Oh, yeah, totally. In fact, it's by far the single best thing that I've ever done in my entire existence. (laughs) No joke. I mean, so the YouTube channel is how I basically got the job at Valve and the job at Google. So, yeah, it's it's been pretty cool. It's a case of if you build it, people will come. It's I think that it, yeah, it's a case of just basically sharing with what you have. Like people always say, don't worry if your code is ugly, just post it. And it's kind of the same idea. It's like, we'll just show what you're working on and then people can see it and comment on it and don't worry about the criticism, basically. And keep doing. Yeah, yeah. What do you think has made you successful? I mean, there's a lot of YouTube channels out there. Oh, um, probably um, sticking with a niche audience. Like I don't, I've I've had a lot of temptation, well, not a lot, some temptation to make the channel much more topical, like a a more generalist sort of science channel. So I purposefully leave lots of details in and I purposefully don't have animations and I purposefully don't do topics that I know that a lot of people would like, but you know, aren't interesting to a small group of people. So even though 170,000 subscribers, you know, sounds like a lot, it actually is niche compared to like Smarter Every Day or Veritasium or one of those guys. I like their channels too. It's just sort of a different audience. Yeah. And it's fun to do what you do. Yeah. And not necessarily to try to do what other people do. Yeah, I think exactly. So that is, in fact, that's a, that applies to like all kinds of businesses. If you try to um, worry too much about like, you know, what you think people want, then, you know, you've kind of lost your mission. Whereas if you just concentrate on what you think is good, then you have a a coherent vision of what's going on. I agree with that. Do you have any other advice for people interested in starting YouTube channels? Um, no, I, I think they should do it. I think it's a great medium. It's a good way to, you know, get exposure. It's a great way to get comments. I'm actually really happy with the comment section on my videos. And I, I do almost no policing. Like I've deleted maybe three or four comments ever in the history of my channel. Otherwise, everything that everyone writes is up there. So that's been super cool. Um you could, I, I think if I were giving advice to someone, I would say, um, 
keep it short and edit. And that's, that's about it. Cool. Well, I have certainly not kept this very short. Ah, sorry. <laughs> and I don't think there'll be much editing. <laughs> but so that we can have a little bit more afternoon, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Hmm. Well, I knew this was coming. And so I've been thinking sort of off and on throughout the uh, this uh, yeah, show here what my final thought was going to be. I actually thought that the questions from Valve were going to be much more invasive than they were. <laughs> <laughs> that was barely scratching the surface. I thought that was just the warm up to sort of, you know. <laughs> so that's my final thought. <laughs> well, now, I, now I want to know. <laughs> what should your Valve coworkers have asked about? I... <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I didn't know what to expect. So I was expecting that, preparing for the worst, and hoping for the best. I warned Ben that he didn't have to answer those questions if tongue butt troller was yeah. embarrassing. But oh, no, that he was, answered all of them. And oh, so yeah, that was apparently there were some that were embarrassing oh. that I didn't get. Yeah, it could have gone much further south. Than that. Phil, you've disappointed me. <laughs> Next time, do better. But for now, my guest has been Ben Krasnow, hardware engineer at Google Life Sciences whose Applied Science YouTube channel is pretty amazing. If you don't learn something neat watching one of his videos, double your money back. Don't forget about the San Francisco Hackaday Conference in November and propose a talk today. Thank you, Ben, for being on. Of course. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. And of course, thank you for listening. If you'd like to say hello or send us robots, wow, that must have been copied from last week, uh, but, you know, if you want to send us robots, sure. Do hit the contact link on embedded.fm or email show at embedded.fm. We will talk to you next week. But I do have a final thought before we go. This one is actually a quote from Ben Krasnow. When he talked about building the liquid nitrogen generator. Building things to practice building things. I'm sure I could have bought a commercial air dryer for cheaper and quicker but then you don't learn anything.